Jackson, not the one that probably comes to your mind. Uh, another guy who's an anthropologist and he traveled with some Australian Aborigines. And he said, it was easy to understand the Aboriginal belief that children were born of a place as well as of human parents. That each person is an incarnation of a landscape. I am the blue sky when the sun shines. I am the white sand in the khaki bushland. I'm the gum trees and the kookaburras, the paperbark trees and the wetlands. I'm the traffic and the empty buses. I'm the bike paths and the buildings, the smiles and the irreverent sense of humour. I am bare feet walking and the blue blue in the ocean. I am Perth. It's my responsibility to care. So it's my love for and frustration with this place. And that took me across the world to Sweden to do twice to do um, studies in sustainability. The first one was a master's in strategic leadership towards sustainability. Um, so much of what David was just talking about is, is really juicy stuff that that master's degree was full of. Um, I don't know if I saw um, theory U references. Yeah, Oceano, I'm in love with him. Lots of stuff, not as much as he's doing, but um, sustainable cells. Was my, my thesis in this master's degree was called Sustainable Cells, Shifting Paradigms Within Individuals as the Core Driver to Reaching a Sustainable Society. That's that word paradigm that I also really fell in love with during that master's degree. I came back to Perth and um, decided to move back to Sweden and, and do further studies. This time, this time it was a master's in human ecology, culture, power and sustainability. But by the time I went back there, Perth really had got me again. So I was kind of hooked and, and my masters started to focus in on Perth from the beginning. And, and it was wonderful to be able to look at Perth through the lens of another place and another culture. Um, I came back, I got a job at City of Canning and I completed my, my second masters. This time it was called Being Human in the System. A journey into sustainability and local government in Perth, Western Australia. It was me taking this sustainable self into the world of systems and structures and government and seeing how I can <laughs> work in that. Um, yeah, this is what I wrote in my second thesis. I'm a Perth girl, a sustainablest with deep ecology leanings who sees that big, deep, profound change is needed in Perth to make it a more sustainable, resilient, wonderful, vibrant, happy place. My purpose, and as such this thesis, is to try to find the leverage points within the system to, the, to be the most effective in making changes towards sustainability for my home. Uh, so the other key concept here that I want to talk about is leverage points. Has anyone come across leverage points in their studies? I know you called Janella Meadows. It's a beautiful article. And I'm, I'm talking about what, what really I like about this concept is what we're dealing with when we're talking about change for sustainability is a really, really complex system. And each one of us has only got so much energy where we can focus to affect this change. 
And so you know, this idea of leverage points is where, you know, where can we affect our, put our energy in order to try and affect the most change for the system. So she came up with these 12 points. Don't try and read them all. Um, I'm just putting them there. Find her article and read it. But again, I'm directing you to, to one and two, three. That's where my heart lies, always. It's in the changing the paradigms, changing the way that we understand self and the way that we understand the world. Um, what I like is that in her work on leverage points, although everything within the system is, the, is worth working on, it's the human within the system. And the fact that the system, the human, we create the system, so therefore we can actually change it. That's the most powerful place. Another concept is about becoming more conscious, more aware of what we're not conscious of. You know Winston Churchill, there's a famous quote you may have heard, it says, first we shape our buildings and then they shape us. Anyone heard that one? Similar idea here, uh, stuff, stuff, things. <coughs> we, we are so used to them that we don't see them anymore. Um, the background, the, they become the background and frame to our behaviour. So it achieves its mastery over us because we constantly fail to notice what it does. When I'm talking about this, I, I believe that we need to recognise the degree to which we are shaped by the invisibilities of our culture. The stuff, the systems and structures, material and immaterial, that shape us. The extent to which we are an unconscious product of our culture. Consumption is genuine too beautifully. Our identity, our values, our desires, they're all to a large degree a product of our culture and the system that we live within. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the second masters. So my question was, local government sustainability, how do we do it? And where are the leverage points? And, and I am going to offer you a few little things that really have stayed with me over the last couple of years. The first one is the council chamber. There is so much power in the council chamber. These people that are elected make decisions that affect you to such a large degree. And so many of us are unaware who our members are. We don't vote because we don't have to. Now, in my thesis, I got to interview some fantastic leaders and I got to witness firsthand some shocking ones. And, and I just became, it, it just stayed with me that if we actually, as sustainableists, decided to use that power that exists, which is the local government arena, and stand up for, for what we believe in and get election and get behind some people, we could have such change. There's just such power. It, it blows me away. So if I could say one thing, if you could take home that, you know, run for run for the local government. Or be aware of who's running it and vote for the people that actually stand for something because they really make decisions that affect so much and want really good we, we want really good people in power. Um, the next one is about growing human beings. Um, paradigm shifting. I'm really, really um, a fan of this. Uh, the inner work of sustainability is what David, I think, referred to also. Um, education, learning, awareness, taking responsibility. I can't go into it in detail. This is another guy that's great. His name is Peter Senge. He wrote a book called Learning for Sustainability. And this is what he says about sustainability in a work. The other thing that I became really aware of when it is connected to growing human beings is growing as human beings in relationship. We need to work together. Humans, yeah, we're the problem, we're also the solution. And doing the pointing and the that's where the problem is, is not going to get us anywhere. We need to really get everyone on the same team and we need to learn how to do that. Um, I think we've lost so many skills around how to, how to collaborate, how to negotiate, how to listen. Um, there's so much I could talk about here. The, the first Masters was very much relationship school. It was all about heart. The second one was more head, but there was a lot of work here, and I'm more than happy to pass on details, references to anyone who wants to go further this way. And the last one is activist art. You know, the system, you can only do so much in the system. Work outside of it, like pay pedestrian lines where they need to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't think I can't go too much further. Growing Human Beings, the, this, I wanted to write this guidebook, I still haven't done it. It was part of our master's project for the first thesis. Like, uh, how, how do we, a lot of what David was talking about, that self-reflection, the practice, the changing habits, how do we do that? I've only revisited it because of this talk, so I'll, I'll look better at that. And at the City of Canning, we're wanting to, you know, also go through a strategic sustainability process. So I'm hoping to do it at a very deep level. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, the last one I want to tell you is um, that we're all important in this, and that there's this prophecy called the Shambhala prophecy that I heard about, and it stayed with me. And I'd like to finish with that, because I think that's where we're at. So, there is a story in ancient Buddhism that speaks of a time that will come in human society where the powers that be are at the edge of destroying the world and everyone in it. During this time, greed has been taken to the extremes and the population is on the brink of apathy and hopelessness. It's during this time that the Shambhala warriors will awaken. The Shambhala warriors do not have a uniform. They are no particular race, culture, creed. You cannot tell them from their clothes, nor the way they look. They have no badges, they don't carry swords, but they all hear and answer to the same call. These warriors will infiltrate every part of the system of the powers that be and work on dismantling it from the inside out and the outside in. They will stand outside the system and fight it. They will infiltrate every level of the system and work in roles from top to bottom. They will sit in silent prayer and bring vision to a new way of being. They will nourish and nurture their children on whole foods and feed them stories of a new world of hope and enlightenment. They are the mother, the brother, the CEO, the receptionist, the hippie, the musician. They are you and they are me. They're us. Sustainability warriors. Sustainablists. Here. I think that we're all very happy and feeling very inspired, but I'll just remind you, you know, we do have different points of view, so let's stay respectful in our conversation. And also, please, um, if you could please be succinct, and that goes for you too, speakers, just succinct so that we can answer as many things as possible, and then we can continue the conversation afterwards anyways. So who has a burning, ooh! Thank you. This is a question for all three of us. When you talk about change and changing people's behavior, how do you do it in such a way that people don't think that you're proposing a problem with the Did everyone hear that? He asked, when you're proposing, you're not proposing a problem about it, but you're just asking someone about change, suggesting someone they need to change. Or they, should, they could change, or they should. should. <laughs> I would ask them if they're interested in changing, and ask them what do they want to change, or more importantly, what's important to them. What are their values that they carry in their heart that maybe they don't really have conversations with and invite them to start that conversation. And they can start that conversation with themselves through reflection. So the notion of um, suggesting change or um, in a sort of a, 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 a parental way of you must change is, it's a crop. It, you know, it's, what's the point? Um, Connecting people to their values, connecting people to what's in their heart and what's the common threads that they might find with others through sharing those conversations. That's where change begins and that's all I'll be inviting anyone to do. Uh, and, and I'd say that I feel really blessed that I can now take that into my paid work because I'm asking clients to do the same thing. <laughs> Think of um, when you go to the doctor. So, well, have you ever been to the doctor and the doctor said you need to 
you need to lose weight, you need to eat healthier. Did you change your behaviour then? Most people don't when they're talked to that way. Um, there's this thing called motivational interviewing. Have any of you heard of that before? So it's a way of um, asking certain questions to elicit change from the individual. So activate their kind of intrinsic values. There's this also um, there's this idea in psychology called or theory called theory of change, and it says people are basically at different levels when it comes to say you want to stop smoking. People are at different different levels. Uh, Pre-contemplation, they haven't even thought about the need to quit. Contemplation, thinking, oh, actually, I should give it, give it up, but this isn't good for me, I've got a bit of a cough. And you have, to, you have to target your approach to whatever level they're at. So I recommend looking up theory of change. There's lots of good research on that. And there's yeah, different strategies you use at each level. Where the person's at. Nobody asked me, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw it out there. I'm not an expert on change as such. But I, I, I wonder if we're asking the right question. Should we be asking ourselves how we can change rather than asking how we can get other people to change? And that kind of theme has been brought up by all of our speakers, you know, doing that inner work first. What's the next question? Up the back? Yeah, uh, I like the uh, the lady in the centre there who, who talked about the city of Kent. I thought that was actually quite brilliant because I've been fighting as a lobbyist, as an activist, as a petitioner, stood the council, stood in the last state election, in, in, in particularly against uh, the city of Durham and local governments. And uh, also, there was a good article in the West Australian the other day, Simon Withers, about our waste management systems and the bureaucracy and the level of bureaucracy and the fact. There are a lot of them, but your points up there are very relevant to how the, the waste authorities you work with. There are too many levels of bureaucracy, and, and it's covering the, the, the top of the iceberg, not the inner self, the inner part. Uh, but I've got two questions. Is how can you get the big commercial corporations like coal, uh, like Coca Cola, for instance, to change? Because that requires, not us changing, it requires um, the big corporations who, who are part of the mainstream life. In Australia and in global, have such a strong power on consumerism and they drive and they're driven by profit. So that's the first thing. And secondly, if you can get people to change it in the normal mainstream way, and I would call themselves a sustainability and environmentalist, how do you get people out of the mainstream life, apart from big corporations, to change without asking those questions? Because a lot of local governments will come back and people will come and say, you're trying to change, uh, drive change too quickly. You're trying to leverage those changes in the community and society too quickly. And they say, yes, you're working too fast. So, 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 so the question so, is, how do you get big companies like Coca-Cola to change? And the other part of the question? Was how do you get people to, how do you get people to change and accept the fact that we have to change to become more sustainable? So how do, how do we get people to embrace who wants to take that on? I'll go first. Just that conscious consumerism, you know? Uh, choose where you spend your dime. Well, sorry, dollar. You know, there's a lot of power there. Again, we, we, we do, me, myself, and I also, very, a lot of it unconsciously, but where you spend your money, those corporations, from what I understand, they understand money. So that's one first suggestion there. Yeah. Um, oh, sounds like Jane wants, oh, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Go! go. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, it's funny, isn't it? Oh, yeah. um, the second part, well, the second question about how do we, you're talking about creating a shift, mainstream people, a shift in lifestyle. Look, I think advertising has a lot to answer for. Um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, have you heard that they've recently I think it was last year. They banned all outdoor advertising. They legislated for that. Now, people—it's kind of a for that. Um, people said because the, the government was, they saw outdoor advertising as a form of mental pollution, and the people said actually it's great not having these billboards everywhere and being bombarded with these ads. We feel like we, we can think, we feel mentally freer. So I think we need to start regulating advertising because um, advertising, uh, they're re reinforced, constantly reinforcing 
uh, these materialistic messages that to be a successful person you need to acquire all this stuff. Um, so regulating advertising and um, yeah, I think that's a huge one, huge one. Uh, there's an author, um, Joanna Macy, who, um, one of the greatest deep ecologists, um, she said that uh, there's three main areas where we can drive change. One, one is within politics, through policy and regulation. She said you can work within institutions and within organisations, and a lot of us have been there and still are there. And you can also be an activist at the front lines. And um, James, or something, did you comment, Jane, about getting out there and painting the line where they need to be painted or something like that? That's activism. Yeah. I spent nights out down in the forest up in the tree campaigns long before I had grey hair. Um, and I'll do it again. It's lovely, that, that activist life. Absolutely fantastic. Um, policy, yeah, I don't know. I think regulation is absolutely necessary, but once regulation is created, it's just the minimum standard anyway. So regulation, meeting best practice is a hard thing. Um, I think all of those fronts are really, really important. But, yeah, there's always this notion of, of self-organisation and emergence. That things are going to happen anyway. And I think, I, I keep coming back to it, when people truly find the deeper in themselves and, and they get out of their headspace around this stuff and really start living that life, um, yeah, things will really strongly emerge from that. And, you know, we are, we're locked into a, an old mechanistic paradigm still. And but, I mean, really, the whole sustainability agenda has been railroaded by the old mechanistic paradigm. It's above that borderline, greenwash, fairly superficial stuff. And, you know, I'm not bagging any organisations that create their own global reporting initiative, reporting framework. It's fantastic.